This is East Idaho Newsmakers with Nate Eaton. Well, I promise that we have a fascinating discussion here on East Idaho Newsmakers today. Rick Davis, he has been the Madison County Coroner since 1982, likely one of the longest serving in the states. I haven't confirmed that, but uh, that's a long time. That's a long time. And, and you have decided to officially retire at the end of the year. Someone else has been elected to your, your position, which Correct. a lot of people may not know this is an elected position. Correct. And what Correct. does a coroner do? Let's define terms. There's a coroner and a mortician. Now, mortician, M-O-R-T is French, that means dead. So a mortician is a person who deals with dead bodies. That's your normal funeral director, that's your normal funeral parlor, that's when grandpa dies and they pick him up and take him and embalm him and put him in the casket. That's a mortician. A coroner is completely different from that. He is the king's representative. Let me give you a little history, this is fascinating. This is just a little bit older than Magna Carta, mm -hmm. which is, what, 1215 at Runnymede. But um, in the 1100s, the king got concerned about his local sheriffs usurping their authority and sweeping a few things under the rug here and there. So the office of coroner, cor is for crown, so the king's representative, the coroner, would go out and he would ride throughout the counties um, of the land and basically double check what the sheriff was doing to make sure that the sheriff was keeping his nose clean. So as a result, the two offices are very definitely separate even today. Even today, uh, I am elected rather than appointed. And because of that, I'm beholding to no one. If I was appointed by the sheriff, then if the sheriff wanted to, he could basically tell me, Rick, sweep this one under the rug. And such things can be done. You know that and I know that. No, it isn't legal. Of course, yes, it is done. But I don't have to answer to the sheriff. I don't have to answer to anybody except the people who elected me. And therefore, I don't have any pressure that way that you would expect in some other offices. So let's say someone is killed. Okay. What, what is the process t today? Mm -hmm. you're, okay. you're the coroner. What happens? As soon as there's a death, uh, any, nine, any, nine death? One, any death outside a hospital, let's define that. Okay. The coroner's job is to ascertain cause of death, physical, outside a doctor's jurisdiction. Two people can sign a death certificate, a doctor, a coroner. If you die in the hospital from cancer, from whatever, if your oncologist takes over, then the doctor signs it. If you die in a car wreck out here on Sunnyside, my phone rings. You're responsible for all deaths outside a hospital. And it's countywide. Every county has a coroner. Uh, I'm the Madison County Coroner. There's one in Bonneville. His name's Rick Taylor. He's a good friend. There's one in Jefferson. There's one in Fremont. Every county has one. The office is evolving. Um, right now, a lot of states, and certainly in big cities, I mean, if we were in L.A. or something like that, you have a medical examiner rather than a coroner because the office requires a lot of medical knowledge, and so you've got doctors who do that. You get into small areas like Idaho, how do you become a coroner? I'd like to be your coroner, and so I run for the office and get it. You have to, you know, hug kids and kiss babies <laughs> and things like that. Uh, but you get it, it's an elected office. But, but did you have some, some training? To None. None? None. Do you want to hear how I became coroner? Please, this yes. Is, this is crazy. Through photography. Little quick story. I've worn three hats my whole life. I'm faculty at BYI. I teach history, I teach uh, cultural history, humanities. No connection with that with a coroner. Um, I'm a vet, I'm out of Vietnam era. And when my wife and I were first married, um, we bought ourselves a little starter house and put us in a different ward. And when I went to church, I met the coroner. I didn't know a coroner from a lamppost at that time. And uh, I was also a photographer. My third hat is I owned a photography studio for better than 25 years. Hmm. So photographer and faculty and coroners, the three hats that I've worn my whole life, and I love it. So he called me up one day when he knew that I was a photographer, and this is back in the days, this is in the 70s, mid-70s, uh, I started at 76 as a deputy, when film cameras were what you used, when you really had to know your stuff, what f-stops were, what ASA was, all of those things were manual. There was nothing automatic on a camera at all. 
And so most people didn't take photos. That's when the Instamatic was invented. Anyway, he called me up one day and said, Rick, I need pictures. They're going to be bad. Can you handle it? I said, sure. Of a crime scene or something? Pick you up in three. Well, yeah. He says, I mean, any time that there's a death, he said, it's a bad car wreck and there's blood everywhere. Mm. I said, I'm fine. So he picked me up. It was a mess. It was a bad car wreck. And so I photographed the whole thing for him. And uh, afterward, when we were all done, he said, are you okay? And I said, I'm fine. I'll pick you up next time. <laughs> so that started the process and my phone rang and months later, he said, now you're the deputy coroner. I said, what does that mean? <laughs> he said, $15 a month. Can you handle oh, wow. that? Wow. <laughs> Whoa. Big pay jump there. So, but uh, I said, what is that? He said, if I'm out of town, your phone rings. It's one of those jobs where you just kind of learn. Now, I, listen, it's like being a, a farmer. You don't go to school to learn how to be a farmer. You just go out with your dad every day. And after you've done that for a few years, you get smart about what you do and you don't do. And that's what you were doing with him. And that's what I was doing with him. Okay, so you get elected in 80, 85. 82. 82. Yeah, he got a job transfer. He left. I ran for office. Do you remember your first call out when you were coroner? No. Okay. I remember that one with him, which was my first bad call out, let's say. And, and ha how many would you say? Thousands? Have I had? Yeah. No. Uh, we're close to a thousand. I probably average 40 a year, and yet this year has been crazy. I've had 40 in the last three months. Wow. So there's no rhyme or reason to it. And, and you never know, obviously. No. So there is a crash on Sunnyside. They call you. You go. What, what do you do? Okay. Definition of turf wars. Let's put it that way. There's the police and there's the coroner. Now, historically, let's back up. In the 70s, in the 80s, uh, the coroner was totally in charge of the scene, and the police did what he told them to. If there's a dead body, I'm in charge. End of sentence. I can tell a state cop, excuse me, I'm in charge. That was then. Now, the role of police, thanks to TV, thanks to all these shows like CSI and everything else, People assume that the police come in and take over, which they do, and they do all of the crime investigation. Did a person blow a stop sign? Did a person run a light? Did, I mean, that's the police end of it. But there's a dead body in the car. That's where my job starts. I don't define liability. I don't say, you ran a stop sign. I say, this person died from a transected aorta, from a massive subdural hematoma, whatever. And do you determine that there on the scene? No. It, well. Sometimes, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. It's usually pretty obvious. And you do your homework as well. Um, are there drugs involved? Was, was, was. I mean, you go through all this kind of stuff. I always run tests. I run a tox to see if there's been drugs involved, drinking involved. And, and what, what a, a, tox, a toxology report. Toxology. And right. what does that involve? Money. Money. <laughs> but, but blood? You're drawing yes, their blood? Yes. You always draw blood and urine. And so how do you get urine if they're dead? Sorry if we're going to get graphic, but... Going to get graphic? Yeah. You draw it. Okay. You take a long needle and you go straight into the bladder and you pull out urine. Okay. That's the best test there is for uh, blood alcohol. And, and are you, you're in a lab at this point? I take this to the hospital. You, okay. I give this to the hospital and they run it. Now, two steps on this one. I can get a quick result right there. There's a thing called Medtox that is a little quick test that you can do. And uh, the lab runs it. I just stand there and wait for the piece of paper to come out. And it can tell me right there what his BA was. Was he an 8? Was he a 12? Was he a 14? Something like that. Um, if he's been dead for a while, you know how this works. Your blood continues to metabolize the alcohol in there. And so if you die from, uh, if you drink yourself to death tonight, or if you run off the road in your car and you were, let's say, a 14 when you ran off the road, your body isn't found until tomorrow morning you might be down to an eight at that point. And that's a known fact. If things really are fussy, we use vitreous. You take the vitreous out of the eye. That is far, far slower in the way that it analyzes, that it, that it breaks down the alcohol. And so I could run something on the blood and get an eight and run vitreous and get a 14. Hmm. There's that much difference. And so if, if we really get nasty on it, why, I'll use vitreous. Have you ever not been able to determine the cause of death? Never. No. What about some of these cases where the body's severely burned or... So it's burned. 
died because of, of burns or yeah we had we had a horrible horrible case years ago where we had uh, five kids six kids that burned to death in a trailer fire mm -hmm. it was one of those nights one of those days when the Rexburg wind is blowing where the the valley is horizontal and these kids had a sleepover and um, all went to bed and the fireplace was in the front of the trailer if you will and they were all in the back and the wind was blowing this way and somebody opened the window so it was just this funnel oh and all the, and who's to say how or why the parents were gone at the time, but the whole place just got engulfed in a flash fire. Well, those kids were all burned to just little poor little charred remains. They were all children, but the autopsy showed that they all died from smoke inhalation, not from fire. Hmm. So they died peacefully. They were still in their beds. None of them were found trying to get out a door, trying to get out a window. They were all curled up in their beds. Oh my. Sound asleep. So the good news is they died quickly, they died painlessly. Is that more common in fires? That's a variable. It, 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 either way. But, but smoke inhalation will take you down far quicker than you would think. What has been the most emotionally tolling or, or devastating thing you've worked on? Um, getting called to a guy who uh, was in a pickup. This was out at... Um, Twin Bridges. They just said, there's a guy in his pickup who's dead. And I went out and he's a good friend. I went to school with him. Mm. And I looked at him and I says, I can't say his name. Anyway, I said, you know, what have you done this for? And there were two fifths of whiskey right there next to him. And he just basically poured them down. Your body can assimilate a lot. It can't assimilate that much that fast. I mean, alcohol is a poison. It kills you. I mean, what you have to do to get drunk is just insane. I mean, you have to saturate your liver until it says, okay, we can't do any of this anymore. And it bypasses it, and you've still got loaded blood that now goes to your brain, which starts bumping cells up there. And then you get a buzz. And you think, this is fun. I said, you have no clue what you just did to yourself. You do an autopsy and look at the liver of a drinker. You don't have to do anything but open him up and go, this guy's a drinker. You know right away. Instantly. Wow. Instantly. You've all seen a liver. You know what a liver looks like. Normal, healthy, that color. That's a liver. I've seen one that was orange, just almost bright orange, and shriveled up and just, you think, okay, that, that organ is now dead. It has ceased to function. Highest BA I've ever had, it was a 72. 72? Now an eight is what it takes to be called drunk by the cop. If you're a non-drinker, if you're some young teenager and you've never had anything and your buddy finally convinces you to take some beers and let's go get drunk, you're going to get drunk at a 10. You'll be getting a good buzz at 10. If you're a persistent drinker, if you're somebody who's drunk for a long time, you need to go to a 14 or a 15 or something like that before you start feeling what they're feeling. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a chronic alcoholic, you can be a 30 and still be talking just like this. But he was at 72. He was at 72. Wow. Yeah, that's what I said when I saw the number. I said, I can't believe that. Now, we were, we were talking before we started that uh, 2000, the, the Coneco case up in yes. Rexburg. Yes. Um, give a little background for those people that might not be familiar with it. Interesting case. Um, a family lived in a house. Right behind it was a large, large trailer house where the daughter and her husband lived. And they had a daughter at this time. The daughter was a teenager, 20. Uh, it's been too long, I forgot yeah. the specifics. Anyway, this daughter and mom, if you will, got into a fight and said, we're not gonna speak to each other. Well, time passed, and then time passed, and then time passed. And then people started to wonder, Whoa, don't you say anything? Nope, and the trader basically locked up. They locked the doors and didn't go anyplace. And so finally, a couple of years later, the mom said to the police, I want to see my granddaughter and my daughter still alive. They, it's called a welfare check. And so they went to the trader and knocked on the door and they came and said, hi, we're still fine. And that was that. Uh, another year passed, another year passed, and grandma wanted the same thing. And this time, why, they went to the house and uh, nobody was there. They called and got the dad and said, we need to go in and see them, see if they're okay. And he said, I'll have to be there when you go in. That was the clue, if you will. And when we opened the door, 
it, one smell told you that we had a dead body in there. Um, and two dead bodies, the mother and daughter. Bodies. Long story short, uh, there were plenty of rumors that went all over the place on this. It went national. And, and everybody, of course, accused the dad of murder, no. Accused the dad of starving him to death, no. There was food, there was anything they wanted. Of their own volition, they died. The daughter died first. I think, I think, this is just me, that she went into the bedroom and said, if this is life, if I'm basically under house arrest from now until who knows when, I'm done, and got in bed and died with food right here. A year later, mom said, I think I did the wrong thing, and got in bed and died also. And we got the phone call nine months, eight months after that. And it wasn't suicide. No, it wasn't suicide, nor was it murder. It was voluntary. And, and David Kaneko, the, the, the father, father the has since passed away. Yes. Uh, he, was char he was charged with some minor, not He was minor, charged with failure to report a dead body. Yeah, it, 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 and didn't really serve any time or... No, for what? Yeah. See, if you see a dead body and you fail to report it, should you be jailed? No, that's silly. Most normal people would say, there's a dead person over there, and they would call the authorities. That's I, only logical. Wasn't a new law passed because of that case Correct. in Idaho? Correct. That if you see a dead body, you do have to Correct. report it. Which is silly. So that one went national, and, and you used um, an armed force, forces? That was interesting. I don't know if you've ever read the Patricia Cornwall series. Um, she, in the 90s, wrote a whole series of books be, as if she were the Virginia, the state of Virginia medical examiner. And so she took all these high-profile cases and rewrote them as a novel. It was before CSI, and it was exactly the same thing. Far, far better, though. Well, anyway, when this hit, I said, I need somebody with that caliber of background to do the autopsy. We took it to a, a pathologist to begin with. He said, I don't know anything. I can't touch this. They're too far gone. I'm not afraid to pick up the phone. So I called, first of all, the University of Virginia and tried to get her and they said no you can't this you can't that you need another one which is I think it's in West Virginia it's called the body farm and it's that's another fascinating story uh, they actually have cadavers maybe 50 60 bodies throughout a large area some in cars some outside cars some in shade some in sun some in in all states of decomposition with a clipboard right next to them with a daily log of the decomp and what it's going through and what bugs are there. Mm. And because of that, anybody who is in the uh, legal area can use those records to backtrack on a body and say, here's a body, we've found it, here are the kind of bugs, here's what we think, and based on this, they can pinpoint the cause of death far, far better than anything we could ever do before. And it's called the body farm. It's called the body farm. You can Google that. Wow. That's crazy. I called them. They said, no, you don't need us. We, you need a guy named Bill Rodriguez. And I said, who's he? He said, he's the number one pathologist on earth. He works for the Army. He's in Washington, D.C. Why not? I picked up the phone and dialed the number and got him. Hmm. I said, are you kidding me? This is a, so I said, here's what's going on. Here's the story. He said, that's interesting. I'm a little busy right now. This is when the Gulf War is on. Mm. This is when uh, he had Saddam Hussein and that whole group right there, and he was the one who does the autopsy on anybody who is a high, high profile person in that war wow. to make sure that this is the right person. Yeah. So he said, I'm a little bit busy, but send me everything you've got. So I got everything out to him in a day, and he called me up and said, I'm very interested, I'm coming. I said, I got a plane ticket. <laughs> so we met wow. in Boise at the state lab, and he did the autopsy. And he's the one who basically narrowed down the times of death, more or less. It's still very, very ballpark. Yeah. Very ballpark. So on those type of cases, you, you mentioned CSI television shows where we as the public expect answers within minutes or hours. Those are so correct. It, and that's so sad because that's the public perception. If I run a tox, for example, now a blood alcohol I can have within an hour, a tox, if I think that you've been doing math, if I've got any problems at all with math, and there's math all over the place right now, how do I know? 
That's a fussy little test, and you don't run that one in 10 minutes. And I use a lab that's back in the Midwest for anything that's critical like that. Basically, that's a four-week test. Mm -hmm. And at the end of four weeks, just to make sure, they run it again. It's a double blind. So eight weeks later, I get a result. And that's why the public says, well, I've seen it on CSI. They have it in yeah. 30 minutes on yeah. there. They've got this fancy lab. And I says, that's La La Land, guys. Yeah. That's TV. And pe people, why haven't they released yeah. the cause of death? Are they hiding something? Is I will it... get phone calls like that. And I'll say, please understand, this is not TV. Now, you're on call 24-7. Correct. And you, uh, I, I assume you've been called out on holidays, weekends, nights. Always. Anytime. I, that's when people die. I mean, night, I sleep with my phone right here under my pillow. I have my whole life. I'm used to getting it. When I go to bed at night, I have my clothes laid out in case the phone rings. More people die at night than in the day? Sixes. Okay. Yeah, I can't say that. Um, teenagers, drunks, people driving off the road, that's going to be from 10 to 2 in the morning. Um, grandma dies of old age. It's almost always early in the morning. Hmm. If you've been asleep all night and then you stand up and you tell your body, time to get going, that's sometimes when the body says, we're done, thud. Wow. A lot of 6 a.m. phone calls. Dad was just getting out of bed and fell over. Dad was just and fell over. That's, that's common also. What, what have you seen as far as suicides since you've started? Numbers. An increase. There's, there's been a definite spike in, uh, and the corollary on that one is, and auto deaths have gone down. Auto deaths used to be terrible, and it's because cars were terrible. Cars were filled with sharp, pointy things. I mean, when you got in a wreck, all the chrome, all that chrome trim in your dash, along the side of your windows, all that stuff, those are little sharp knives coming at you. And thank goodness the auto industry has completely reversed the way that it used to make cars. And now you have a, basically a core cage and everything around it just collapses. So you can drive by the freeway and see two cars and the front end of both of them is clear up to the windshield, heretofore you would have had some dead people in there. Now you've got two people standing there talking to each other saying that was a really bad wreck. Hmm. Now thank goodness for technology, they've changed that. You, you've mentioned here since 2000, 40 auto deaths in Madison County. Between 2000 and 2010, 32, but since 2010 only eight. Yeah. And that's eight years. It's amazing how it's gone down. And, and I, I don't attribute that to speed. I mean, we've increased the speed on the freeway. Yeah. No, I attribute it to well-made cars. Suicides since 2000, 38 suicides, 32 men, only six women, but almost all over 40. Yeah. Women are, bless their hearts, they're tender souls, and sometimes they, it, life is just too much for them. They just, they have something that really hits them hard, and they've got a, I, I had a little lady who went out, and uh, her uncle, not even her husband, her uncle, who she was very close to, had died. And she was inconsolable, and she went out and laid down on his grave and shot herself. Oh. Now, that's just, that is so sad. This is so far from some, <coughs> excuse me, from some teenager who just, you know, gets crazy and shoots himself. Mm-hmm. So women basically are older because, I don't know, they care more about themselves. Guys are too spontaneous. They get mad and they gotta do something about it right now. And so men, as a rule, use a pistol, uh, sometimes a rifle, but usually a pistol. And they're usually younger. They're more around 20. Women, 40 plus. Has, does anything make you squeamish? Not anymore. Did it in the beginning? I can't tell you that story. Okay. <laughs> that, that sounds like a good one. I can't but, tell you but, that story. But it's rare. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of, you're, you're used to, I don't want to say you've seen it all, but have you seen it I all? I have seen it all. I've seen things that you wouldn't believe. I've smelled things that you wouldn't mm -hmm. believe. That's usually what gets people to smell. How do you then go home and have dinner or go to sleep? No problems. Did you, that take time? A little. My first autopsy was, let's say, my speed bump. And after that, I've been just fine. My children, um, I got four kids, daughter and three sons, all of whom are well into this, all of whom know when dad's on a call and he comes back home, so what happened? 
and they, they get told everything straight up. Uh, an autopsy, same thing. Back in the day when you could do this, I got all of them in on an autopsy. They've all been on an autopsy and stood right there. And trust me, nothing teaches you better than an autopsy. And that is a story I would love to do. I, I would love to have you there as a person who doesn't know and just say, just a moment, and let me open this up, do the Y incision and roll back this and take out the sternum and here we go. And you say, I've got one of those. I've got, wow, yeah. I've got one of those. Is that what that looks like? It's yeah. fascinating. It's a miracle is what it is. You mentioned back in the day when you could. We were talking about privacy issues, yes. how, how so much has changed in society and That's maybe sad. because of the media. What, 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 just talk about that. Well, first of all, the media is onto everything, as you know. Ever since Ted Turner and 24 News, we've got to have something to fill the space. Therefore, we generate stories which aren't really stories, but we generate the stories anyway. And so the public is now insatiable on anything, and given cell phones and anything like Flickr or things like that, we've got instant stuff that's going everywhere. So it's just this viral wave that goes no matter what has just happened, because people want to know right now, please. They don't need to know that. The world would be a much, much better place if people didn't know most of that stuff. If I had the way to say it, I'd say no media on this. None. We might fight you on that. But. Oh, of course you would. It's your business. <laughs> yes. But I'm saying that your business feeds, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, that famous newspaper slogan. Yeah. Um, it's sad that it has to be that way. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because we could spend months doing a big investigative piece into journalism or into education or, or sure. health care or something. And, and we can tell how many people click and read it. But like you said, a, a bloody car crash that takes us two minutes to write. Top line. Through the roof. How often do you get calls from people you know or text from, hey, what happened? What, yeah. Every time. Every time. If it's something that's a big one, the famous bank robbery in Rexburg, well, not bank robbery, the drug robbery, uh, the Walgreens in Rexburg, we had a guy who went in there, held him up at gunpoint, then, silly man that he was, walked down the street to the bank on the corner where there was the shootout, and he died, I would say, suicide by cop. I mean, he knew where he was, he knew he was surrounded, and so he just started taking shots, and that was the end of that. Yeah. Well, everybody wanted to know all of the detail on that one, of Immediately. course. Immediately. Sure, yeah. right now. And no, I don't. I don't tell them. I say, need to know. Um, I give out very few details. I never show photos. I photograph everything. Never have shown photos to people. Hmm. That's just, uh-uh, that's, you don't need to know that. And like you said at the beginning, you are your own man. It's not, some people think, oh, the sheriff says not to do it. You are yeah. your own guy. Yeah, the best part about all of this, though, is if I get a call later on, um, three months ago, I got a call from a gal in California. Are you Rick Davis? Yes. Are you the coroner? Yes. My uncle died up there. He was on a trip going through on his way to Yellowstone. He died, da 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 da. He gave me all his background. And I said, was that in? She says it was in uh, 98. I said, just a minute. Because of my program, click, click, click. I popped it up. I said, oh, yeah, I remember this one. I talked her through the whole case, told her what had happened. She said, thank you, thank you. You've now put this to bed. I can now rest easy. Nobody has ever told me what happened and made it make sense. Now, that's my job. And one of the things you mentioned before we were rolling is that you've created this program to, to keep a history, I guess, a document all of these. Crazy one, huh? Well, I, I think that that would be beneficial for every coroner, so in case you get that it call would. in 10 years. Yeah, it would. That's, what's the role of the coroner? I mean, it's public, it's PR. It's helping people deal with something that they just don't deal with. I mean, if, if the toilet doesn't work, you call a plumber. If the lights don't turn on, you call an electrician. If grandma died, you call the cops. You, you call a specialist. And if there's a dead body, then there's one more step. You call the coroner. Um, You've got to have somebody who deals with it. That way, it, it works. Are you going to miss it? I will definitely miss it. I hear sirens. My ears prick up. Why, why did you decide to hang it up now? I'd be 80 if I re-upped. And, and uh, the end of my term, I'd be 80. That's, that's old enough to let young guys take over. I guess that you could kind of be on call, I guess. if I could if, be if the, his deputy, yeah. my replacement. I could be his deputy, so I could just still you know, keep my nose in it, if you will. But it's, it's time. 
What would you say is one of the main lessons you've learned over the years? That the human body is a miracle. That you have more redundant backup systems in your body than you've ever dreamed of. That when you walk around and you're healthy, you just take it as a given. Oh my gosh. That students today, that teenagers today abuse themselves. I people see people that weigh way too much. And I said, you're going to kill yourself. You just can't do that. Well, it doesn't hurt. I said, give it 10 years and it's going to. Give it 30 years. That's, that's sad. So I, I see the abuse that way, that people don't see down the road what the results will be. It's like a teenager with car keys the first time. You can't tell him that he needs to be safe. Come on, Dad. You remember what you were like. And it's the same way with people and their bodies. I, I wish that they were more careful. Is, is, would, would you say also, too, that I guess you, you never know when it's going to be your time? You never know. You could be sitting right here. The best, and I've seen them all, but the best way is to be sitting right here and it'd be gone. A massive coronary is, is the ideal way to go. Let's not do that during this table. No, we won't do that. <laughs> you, uh, I've had calls where the husband is dead in bed and his wife was right here next to him all night long and didn't know that he was dead until she woke up the next morning and nudged him and he didn't move. That's how I'd like to go. There's a million ways to go and you always say, would, would I, would I, would I. I want to go peacefully like that. Unfortunately, you don't get to choose. Yeah. yeah. Is there any case that you will always remember? I mean, I'm sure there's a few, but one that we talked about your most memorable one with your friend, but yeah. maybe one that touched your heart a little more? Or... No, not that way. Little grandmas. I've got a lot of little grandmas who I love who say, Rick, when I die, I want you to be the one who comes and picks me up. Oh, nice. That's what I like. Yeah. I like knowing that I can be the person who brings closure, who can help the family deal with something that is traumatic. That's my job. You're also retiring from BYU-Idaho. I will. I will in April. A is there a book on the way? From this? I could write a book so fast. That's what I'm thinking. Like but everybody, you could change the names. It wouldn't make any difference. Madison is too small a county. Everybody would know. Sometimes the best stories come from the small counties. Oh, I could write a book in a hiccup. But, but no, no plans for that. No plans. I, I'm afraid of lawsuits. Yeah. Well, th this has been uh, a fascinating discussion. Is there anything that you want to touch on, you know, b before we go? Anything we didn't get I to? I hope that it's helped explain what a coroner does. I mean, people think that a coroner shows up at the scene and says, yep, he's dead. There's a lot more to it than that. You've got to state why he died medically. On a death certificate, there's four lines. And you've got to fill out those lines as to what actually happened medically. Rick Davis, he's been the county coroner in Madison County for nearly 40 years. 1982 to 2018 has served a lot of people, a lot of families. Thanks for talking with us. Good luck in retirement. You're welcome. And Pleasure to be here. Hopefully between now and then, you won't have to see him. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. Have a good week.